Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to talk about securing guest access into Azure Active Directory. So this is a topic that Adam and I have actually had a lot of conversations with our customers about. A lot. (laughs) And it's certainly something that is concerning to a lot of organizations, especially now that we're remote and we are collaborating a lot more electronically. There's a lot of questions on what can guest users do when they get invited to the org? How can we secure collaboration like if we're sharing documents back and forth and you know how do how do can we do that securely and make sure that our corporate information isn't getting leaked out so first off let's talk about what a guest user is in active azure active directory and how does it differ from a regular user yeah so at its core guest user versus a member user, which is the language that Azure Active Directory uses, it doesn't really have to mean a whole lot at all. It's it's kind of for your organization to understand like where the user comes from. But from the perspective of what can guest users do, guest users can do almost anything that member users can do. And there's many different ways for guest users to come into your directory. So it doesn't really give you a clue on how did this user come in by itself? Just the fact that they're a guest user, there's multiple ways to do it. In fact, a lot of people may not know this, but you can actually synchronize user objects from your on-premises active directory using Azure active directory sync, and you can sync them to the cloud, but mark them as guest user. You may say, well, why would I do that? Well, there's organizations used to have guests in their directory on-premises for certain use cases, and this allows them to extend that model to the cloud. So people say, oh, guest users, that's B2B. That's that's somebody coming in from another Azure AD tenant. Well, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it might be to invite someone's Google account to your Azure AD environment. So just, just separate in your mind that guest user means they came in a certain way because that's not really what it's for. It's more for you to be able to write rules about Member users can do this, but guest users can do that. And there are many ways to delineate between the two. So that's an important concept to understand. And I'd say another really important concept is of like customers versus consumers versus partners and like how those all interact. So an important concept to understand, and this is really fundamental to where this all comes from, is that. Microsoft fundamentally believes, and this is how the entirety of Microsoft 365 is architected. Microsoft fundamentally believes it is more secure to work on a single document that has a single set of permissions, that has a single set of sensitivity labels, that is discoverable, and that has a single set of any other metadata associated with it, right? As opposed to oh, well, we want to separate this out. We want a separate sharing environment to collaborate. You know, we're going to do all of our sharing in Box. So let alone the fact that Box is a Microsoft product, we think that's not a good idea because now you have another copy of the data. It may not have the same information protection controls on it. It may be less discoverable. It may have different data leakage protections. It may have different DLP Uh, engines that fire on it, so they may not detect the same way. It may have less restrictions on data loss prevention in the first place. And so now that you have this extra copy floating around, you have risk inherent to that. You have attack surface inherent to that. So the better idea is let's keep that file in one place and let's bring in people to collaborate as needed. So that's really fundamental concept to understand with anything with guest users and why you would bring and collaborate with external identities in your production Microsoft 365 tenant 
it's because we fundamentally believe at Microsoft that is inherently more secure and more compliant than doing it a different way. Now, if you disagree with that, we can have a healthy discussion on the merits of that. But if you need to understand that fundamental concept before you move forward, that creating copies and other applications is inherently risky and bad. And that's why this model exists. Now, one other thing I want to kind of point out before we really move any further, you'll hear these terms like B2B and B2C. And really what that refers to at the end of the day is, is your organization's relationship relationship with this other identity we're talking about. And so B2C, you may hear that, and that's business to consumer. That's really designed for like end users, like home users, like consumer identities. It doesn't mean it's the only use case, but it's a common one. And we want to create an, an application that's facing them uh, and, and allow them to sign in and access a thing. So I'll give you a, a very real world example. My electric company uses B2C for the, um, for my identity, for me to like go view my bill or me to submit like my street lights out or me to submit my powers out. That is a, a B2C identity. I can actually tell um, because of the URLs that are, that are used when I do those, those workflows or Culver's. Um, same thing. I noticed I was putting in like a curbside order for Culver's. It's a fast food restaurant in the Midwest, great cheese curds, and they use B2C for their online ordering, uh, for Microsoft. So those are, those are examples of like B2C use cases versus a B2B use case would be like, uh, this is, I, I work in this enterprise and we have this, uh, let's say a marketing company that we partner with to help design our ad campaigns. And we have a SharePoint site or a teams site where we collaborate together on our marketing copy and our latest ad campaign. And we all want to work in one location. So we host that all in our tenant and we bring them in. Do you see how that's kind of different? It's more of like an internal business function as opposed to like more of an end customer relationship. And so B2C, the most important thing to understand is that that is a separate directory. It is isolated. It is separate because that is the use case where you say, well, I don't want every customer of our electric company to have an identity in our, you know, or an enterprise Azure Active Directory. Well, no, of course you're not. So when you create a B2C directory, that's an entirely logically separated thing. And that's intentionally done. So just kind of want to, highlight out those different use cases and kind of some of the different lingo we'll use as we talk through it tonight. Just really understand those points is fundamentally, we think collaborating on a single document is inherently more secure. Uh, guest user doesn't necessarily connotate how they came in. So we might talk about that as we go through, but just know a guest user, just it, it's, it's just a, a way to separate them out from your member users. B2B is more for functions of your business and business operations. B2C is more end consumer, and that is a separate directory. So we'll unpack that more as we go along, but that's kind of a starting point to give us some context through the discussion. Another question for you, Adam. Mm -hmm. If you are a Microsoft customer and you own Azure Active Directory P1 or P2 or some of the M365 suites, do you get a certain number of guest users included in that? Yeah. So, so this story has changed over time and it's actually, I think gotten a lot simpler. So I'm just going to tell you the new version and we can skip all the discussion on the old model. Cause it's way more complicated. The new model is there's an concept called an external identity and whether it's B2B or B2C, it doesn't matter. An external identity is someone who doesn't work for your company. Not a contractor, not an employee, not an FTE, et cetera. And we want to bring them in and collaborate with them in some way, either model, B2C or B2B. Every organization gets the full P2, so the best set of features and capabilities for up to 50,000 external identities for free. Absolutely 100% free, no charge. And if they're doing MFA through like an app, you know, push notifications. If you want to use MFA again, totally free. The only time you would ever pay more for those first 50,000 users is if you want to allow like text messages or phone calls 
as MFA options, then those um, do carry an additional charge. And then from there, there are charges after 50,000 where it's it's pennies on the dollar to add additional identities. It's it's an extremely inexpensive uh, offering. So for most orgs and almost any org I've run into where they're like, yeah, we want to bring in you know, a couple hundred business partners, like, all right, it's free. <laughs> like, you don't even have to worry about it. There was a model before, and I said I wasn't going to get into it, but if you ever remember or you hear somebody talk about like a five to one ratio, that's still a thing, and you can still do it that way. That's, it's just, it's complicated. The very, very short version is if you have X amount of Azure AD premium licenses, whether they're P1 or P2, let's say you have a thousand. Well, then you are entitled to bring up to 5,000 guest users in um, at no additional cost. So either way, for most orgs that are licensed with at least some version of Azure Active Directory Premium, you probably have all the B2B users you need without paying anything else. It's extremely rare that an organization would ever need additional licensing to do this. So that's one of the nice things is as you're listening to this show, you can know that you probably have everything you need without any additional cost. So let's talk about secure sharing. Mm -hmm. Sharing controls can be a little bit confusing in M365 because there are sharing controls within Azure Active Directory. There's additional sharing controls within Teams if you're using Microsoft Teams, M365 Groups, and then SharePoint also has granular sharing controls. With SharePoint, you can designate sharing policies for the site, You can do it for different files or different links. You can have different guest sharing settings. One of the best practices is to turn off the anyone sharing. I believe it's on by default for anyone. If you're sharing a specific document, the links will can be shared with anyone who has the link. I would turn this to specific people. It doesn't mean that you can't share it outside the org. It just means that I have to send it to like, you know, Adam's corporate email address. And then he has to then authenticate in order to access that document. So it's a little bit more secure than just having the link out there. And you could set this for the entire org, or you can do it for individual SharePoint sites. You can also uh, have the ability to limit sharing by domain either having a a block list, like you cannot share to these domains, or you can have an allow list, like these are our partners and you can only share to these domains. And then you can also limit sharing by security group. Like let's say you only have these people who are collaborating externally, they're the ones who, who have a business need, You put them in a security group, they're allowed sharing. Teams has its own sharing policies like guest access, private teams, private channels, shared channels. Just know that if you invite someone to a team, it does create automatically a guest user for them within Azure Active Directory. Admins can go in and create a user as well, like by invitation. But if someone invites someone to a team, that also does it. With M365, there is a setting within the M365 admin portal. The default is to allow external sharing. There's also another thing for ownerless groups, and the default is to allow ownerless groups. If it was me, I would recommend having an owner for every group because that can give you more accountability. There's also group expiration, and if you're like some of the orgs out there, Every Teams that gets created, it gets an M365 group. So you have these M365 group sprawl, essentially, and these teams that are out there that never expire with each its own SharePoint, files that may be sitting out there. And so I recommend configuring the expiration for these. And what that does is it sends an email to the M365 group owner or the Teams owner and says, hey, do you still need this teams because we haven't seen anyone post anything or do anything for a certain period of time and the owner has to go in there and extend it. Or if they don't do anything, they let it expire. Now, if you don't have any, those expiration emails will still go to an admin 
And that may be onerous for your admins as they're getting, you know, hundreds of expiring groups um, that are happening. So I would recommend to have a, a group owner. If you check it and say, don't allow any ownerless groups, it will randomly pick someone to be the owner. So people often are surprised when I tell them that Microsoft and in our internal tenant it allows anyone to create a team, which allows anyone to create an M365 group at any time. And, and they're really shocked by that. And we can invite guest users at any time to collaborate as well. All of that is enabled for pretty much everyone in the organization. And a lot of orgs get really hung up on, we need all this governance and we need all of these controls and we need all of these processes. And it's like, a, it stems from like a distrust of their users or like treating their users like they're honestly stupid. Like that, that's a common IT meme to me is that IT people think everyone else in the org is dumb and like not capable of having any power or control. So Andy walked through a couple of the controls here. Microsoft does implement those. You must have an owner to have that privilege of being able to create your own team at any time. And expiration is most definitely a thing. I personally have created many teams at Microsoft and I personally have gotten plenty of emails saying this team is going to expire. And I've had the moment of, oh yeah, I forgot. I, I forgot we had that because we weren't using it anymore. So, you know, I'm happy to allow it to expire. Yes, you know, automated email, please do delete that in 30 days and save me the trouble. So, you know, these are these are good controls to turn on. They're not onerous. They're completely reasonable, but they might be worthwhile trade-offs that can get you to the point where you can, instead of having all this super heavy-handed, our users are dumb governance strategy, you can just be like, let's let our users create the teams they need to get their work done. And let's just put some common sense controls around the naming of them and a how long they're allowed to stick around until somebody has to attest to keep them and perform that at a station. And that they have to have an owner we can run down if we have questions. And by the way, you can even take this one step further. And this is kind of on the same topic. There's integration with Microsoft purview information protection, where as you create your different sensitivity labels in your org, sensitivity labels can also be used to assign a, um, basically like a settings template on a team. So if you have like an internal confidential label, when a user creates a team, it could ask them, hey, what sensitivity label is this team? And it's the labels they already know and the the uh, taxonomy they're already familiar with. And if they pick one that's like confidential internal only, then guess what it does? Automatically turns off the ability to invite external users to it. And the user is using the same language and taxonomy they're already familiar with. So that's another thing to look into as you're configuring this as well, is enabling and using some of those capabilities. Because that's just taking the work you already did to build out sensitivity labels and applying it to another use case. So that's that's some nice stuff as well to, to provide controls. Because that's another thing we do internal to Microsoft is if you create a new team, you do have to pick like what, what kind of content is going to be shared here. Is this highly confidential or is this just general business data? Oh, general business? Well, then, yeah, it's fine to invite external users. Is this confidential? Then, no, it's not. And so it takes care of it for you. It just, as long, I as the users just have to know, like, how sensitive is our conversation? And then the system applies the controls I need from there. In Azure Active Directory, in the admin portal, there is also controls for external identities. And so guest user access is enabled by default and there are a few different types of permissions that can be configured so there's the default user permissions there's member permissions which we talked about in the beginning which are you know your internal organization users but there's default guest users and then there's restricted guest user permissions by default those are the ones that are given and so there's a document within Microsoft Docs that goes over and compares the different permissions that member users get, that guest users get, and then restricted guest users. The default for most orgs is fine, but it does allow the guest users to have access to enumerate what other users might be in the organization, what groups they might be in. 
And this is really there so that they can look up users. Like if you need to find a user within the org to send like an email to or, or whatnot, if you restrict them, they're only able to look up their own information, but that may restrict them from looking up users on like the global address list or in teams. So take that into consideration. The majority of orgs I've been in have used the default guest permissions. And I think for the most part, that's fine, but there is restricted if, if that's a use case for you. Guest invite, as Adam said, at Microsoft, we are allowed to invite anyone to the Microsoft tenant. You can restrict this as well. Like for example, let's say you have a process to put in a request to add someone to the organization as a guest. And then that can go to like a security group that's your service desk or something like that. And they will add them to it. So that way it's audited, it's tracked. You have a little bit more control. You're still allowing those users to be added, but it's, it's more of a process. That may be something that some organizations um, may want to do. So you can do that and limit it to a security group. Just remember your global administrator always has the rights to invite regardless. Good call outs there. I think for most orgs, you're not going to have a problem with the default permissions that guests have. And keep in mind, guests don't aren't born with any particular set of permissions other than whatever workflow you use to invite them. So as Andy's walking through some of these controls here in Azure Active Directory, and we'll talk through a couple more in a second, keep in mind that these kind of override any of the controls at an app level. Think of there as being a hierarchy and that <laughs> ultimately all guest access is managed through Azure Active Directory. And you can have different applications kind of feed off of that. But at the end of the day, you know, Azure AD sets the rules and everybody else has to, to live by them. Um, and, and so, you know, if you invite a guest like through SharePoint, they're going to get created and they're going to have access to like the one file or the one site that was shared with them. They don't have access to anything else. Like people always get really worried about like, we're going to bring them in. They're going to have access to all the things like that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> like other than anything you have like set set to like share with everyone, including guests, which is not a common setting, you know, they don't, they don't walk in the door with access to anything. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. And then a, a couple of the other controls, Andy was walking through some of them about like how you can restrict guest invitations to only a certain security group with a certain role like the guest inviter roles. That's that's one thing you can do. There's also the ability to restrict like what domains can be allowed or blocked from being brought into your environment. So it may make complete sense that if you are in a, a kind of business that has like really, you know, two or three key competitors, our competitors are not allowed in our environment. Like total like that makes sense. If you're Ford, somebody with a gm.com email address can't come in our environment. Like, okay, totally get that. And, and there's been some new controls added as well. They're called the uh, cross tenant access um, set of features. And these basically allow more visibility into like, what are the organizations that users in your tenant have been invited to? And do we want to allow them to be invited to other tenants or just certain ones. Think of this as the opposite of the controls where you're choosing what domains can come into your tenant. Now you're choosing where, what other tenants can your users go visit. So that is, you know, conceptually different. Um, and so there's a, a whole set of additional controls here, and we'll put a link to this in the show notes because this is a lot of new capability for Azure Active Directory and external collaboration that orgs have been really asking for. So when it comes to setting up secure guest access, <clears throat> obviously you want to MFA, right? MFA all the things. So you want to set up MFA for guests using a conditional access policy. Now this does require Azure Active Directory P1 or higher, but you can create the MFA for say all apps and assign it to all guests and external users or the all users within your conditional access policy. You can also set up guest access reviews in a feature called Azure Active Directory governance. Now this is something that is part of Azure Active, 
Azure Active Directory Premium 2. And it is a feature that may not be as well known, but super powerful. And what it does is you can scope reviews, access reviews for different security groups or for different users on a scheduled basis. It's That's one of the use cases, and that's what we're talking about here, but there's other use cases for AAD governance. But for example, if I wanted to say on a quarterly basis, review all the security groups or all the guest users and what they have access to, I can get a report that does that or um, get a, a reminder to, for me to go into the portal to take a look at that. So super powerful, really, really good stuff there. Very pertinent for an IAM team for any type of governance activity. That's often asked. I, I remember my boss asking me all the time, like, hey, can you give me the users in this group? Or can you give me, you know, who has access to this particular thing? And since SharePoint sites or teams are generally built off of M365 groups, you can scope a AAD governance access review around that security group to see who has access to that. You can also reduce some attack surface by requiring guests to use web browsers using like a conditional access policy. So conditional access allows you to say, you know, access only via a browser or, you know, block uh, desktop applications. And that may re reduce some of your attack surface. Another thing is session timeout. So conditional access allows you to have a sign-in frequency. So it's a session control. And you can set that for, say, one day where you're going to have your users sign in, your guest users who have access to your environment sign in every day, right? So their session is going to expire. And then Adam talked about those Microsoft Purview, which was recently renamed. It was Microsoft Information Protection. But you can configure labels to look for keywords and then automatically apply those to SharePoint sites, documents, emails. And so if let's say there's a project and let's say the project is named Elron, right? Project Elron. And so if I scope a DLP policy, I can look for documents or emails containing that word and then if it detects it, it will automatically classify that email or document as sensitive or internal. And then you can even configure another policy to remove guest access to anything with that label. So all this can be done automated without you having to go in there manually to do that. Obviously, there's the configuration of the policies beforehand. And, you know, the licensing, of course, with Microsoft, you do have to have some of the licensing for this. But... Um, very simple to set up and test and then get you know more secure for your guest access. And and some of these ideas came from a Microsoft documentation on creating a secure guest sharing environment, right? Yes. Yeah. So that'll be in the show notes too. Um, th this gives you some good ideas or kind of a checklist of things to look at to consider hardening the environment a little bit. And Andy mentioned something about uh, setting up MFA for guests using the conditional access um, rules. So one of the uh, things that in those cross-tenant access features, and I'm, I can't recall if this is shipped yet or if it's going to ship, but there is going to be the capability to trust MFA if it's been performed in that guest users like home directory. So if I'm Contoso and I invite someone from Fabricam to come into my environment Gosh, I sound like <laughs> I sound like a Microsoft exam when I say this, don't I? Uh, but I invite someone from Fabricam, and they already have to do MFA in the Fabricam tenant. I'm not going to make them do MFA again in the Contoso tenant. Which, by the way, that's how it used to work. If you required MFA, they meant MFA in the resource directory, like where you're trying to access the resource, and it would ignore if it had already been done in the home directory as well. So this is an improvement, a quality of life improvement, where if I trust that Fabricam has a good MFA policy and good, strong security controls, I don't need to make my users do two MFA prompts just to sign in. Um, and so that can really improve quality of life while not really 
uh, taking a hit to security. So that's in those cross tenant access features. And I'm not entirely sure if that is already shipped or is going to ship, but it's coming either way. So check that out too. And finally, one of the things that security teams may or may not know about that also have access into some of your environment, may be your partners, Microsoft partners or managed service partners. There is a delegated administrator roles that can be assigned within the M365 admin portal. And there's a lot of different types of roles, but I'll just call one out, which is called the delegated administrator. That one is actually a global admin and some MSPs, especially for like small, medium businesses who that are using an MSP to manage their M365 environment, maybe to reset passwords or create security groups manage their licensing, you know, they may have granted out a delegated administrator to, you know, someone like an SHI or CDW or something like that to manage for them. Just know that this is a global admin. So they're going to have global admin rights. That's one way to do it. And it's probably the older way to do it. The better way is if you have an MSP that is using the newer way, to use Azure Lighthouse. In Azure Lighthouse, number one, it allows partners to manage multiple customers at scale versus like having to be a delegated admin. You have to receive like an offer and then you can grant granular access to specific resources as the customer to that managed service partner. So it's much more secure. And so if you are thinking about using or are using an MSP or you are an MSP, you know, look to Lighthouse or, you know, look for an MSP that's using Lighthouse because that is probably the better way to do it. The older way is to use these roles, which is okay, especially if you're just a smaller MSP or a small medium business and, you know, you're just paying the one and not having it. But if you're using multiple MSPs and they, you have delegated admins for all of them, that would be concerning. So, it's one place that some security professionals don't know about. They may not even know that it exists as far as IAM goes, but definitely take a look at that because that is another way that you're increasing your tax surface, right? By allowing a partner to have administrative rights within your organization. Right. Absolutely. Good call out there. And I, um, <laughs> I know some people have found out about this the hard way. They got, um, a little surprise when they discovered this. So, I mean, it can be a powerful tool and it's, it's useful when you have that partnership, but it's also just something to be aware of as you're quantifying, you know, who has access to what. And that's our show for this week. Hopefully you guys learned something about securing guest access. Again, this is something that Adam and I have had a lot of conversations with customers about because it is very much timely in, in, the forefront of many customers minds. So definitely take a look at the notes that we put in here. There's going to be a lot of good, good information to go through, mm -hmm. but thanks for listening and watching our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions, thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.